Hi everybody, uh, I'm down here in the corner. Um, just wanted to introduce myself before we get started with class. Uh, my name is Dr. Cynthia Lutkus Pierce. I think I'm officially now the longest uh, last name in the department. Um, a lot of students call me Dr. L. Um, a lot of other students call me LP. Either one you prefer is totally fine with me um, as long as it's said with respect. Um, otherwise, uh, it's great to meet you guys. Um, we are going to be doing um, environmental change hazards and resources. This is Geology 1103. So we're going to be dealing with uh, all sorts of cool topics, um, starting off with basic principles about uh, geology and earth systems, and then we'll kind of build upwards from that, talk about geologic hazards, uh, and then we'll do resources and climate change as we get towards the end of the summer semester. So um, I just wanted to introduce myself quickly so that you at least uh, see me and, uh, and know who I am. Today's lesson, the Tuesday, first day of class, um, we're gonna go through some basic principles. So you'll look at the rest of the PowerPoint today and um, you'll hear me talking, but I'll turn off the video. And then today, Tuesday, we don't have lab today, but we will start with lab tomorrow on Wednesday. That will be um, at 10 o'clock, and uh, the Zoom link is uh, on our uh, As You Learn page, so you can go ahead and join me at 10 o'clock for lab tomorrow. Um, but just make sure that you go ahead and kind of keep up with these PowerPoints as best as you can, um, because a lot of times we will actually be dealing with that day's lecture material in that same day's lab at 10 o'clock. So if you can kind of keep up with the lectures or maybe stay ahead one day with the lectures, things should be pretty good. So, okay, so I'm gonna turn off my video. Uh, you'll still hear my voice um, and you'll be able to follow along with the PowerPoint uh, as we continue. So great to e meet you and I'll see you guys for lab sometime tomorrow. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the rest of the semester. Okay, so information about the course. You should have received a textbook. Uh, I believe they were going to be mailed to you. So the textbook is the Environmental Geology book that's shown here on the right. This is Carla Montgomery's book. Um, and we used to have a lab manual for the course and it looked like the one here shown on the left, but instead I'm gonna be doing these all through Word documents and they are gonna be put up on As You Learn. So not to worry if you don't have a lab manual, um, we're gonna be doing those weekly uh, on the computer. And the first, I think, two weeks are already posted uh, on our As You Learn site, so you can check those out. If you don't have a book, though, um, please let me know, and we will make sure to try to get you one as soon as possible. All right, course goals. I always have to do this, right, just because we want to make sure that you are going to get out of this what um, we think is going to be most important for a student who graduates with this course, but also to... Um, what we also think that uh, students kind of should master in terms of uh, earth system science knowledge but also i want to make sure that you see at the bottom here too like what do you want to get out of this class so i kind of want to know what are the things that you actually want to learn about so if there are particular items that aren't on this list of course goals and there's something that you're really curious about please let me know and we can certainly work those in but um, i'm going to start out with talking about kind of uh, how the earth formed and our place in the solar system in fact we're going to get through that today later on this week we're going to talk about earth's internal structure and its composition so literally the layers of the earth and how we can separate those um, in the next couple of days, we're going to talk about um, change of the planet over time. So through geologic time, we'll look at the evolution of life and the change in Earth systems through the last, you know, 4.6 billion years or so. And basically all this stuff is going to be the basic principles that we will need in order to understand how humans then uh, interact with their environment in the sense that, you know, certain geologic processes are going to cause certain types of hazards. Um, how the environment impacts us, and then of course to how we impact the environment. And then we'll talk about resources, and lastly we'll end on a couple of lessons regarding climate change. So hopefully we'll bring in a whole bunch of information. Some of it uh, you probably will have heard about in other courses, but hopefully a lot of it will be new to you. Um, but we'll also really emphasize uh, the, the link between humans and the natural environment. So the way that the course is laid out, the um, the course is loaded into As You Learn, and I'm slowly still adding stuff to it. So uh, you'll see every day there's going to be an audio PowerPoint that you guys will be able to listen to on your own, very similar to the one that we're doing right now. 
Um, and so uh, each morning, uh, there's about an hour to an hour 15 um, long PowerPoint. And, you know, you can kind of break it up and stop and start and do whatever. That's not a problem. But um, you'll want to keep up with those so that when we go and do the labs, which are on uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, we can build on the knowledge that you learned in those PowerPoints. Now, quick reminder, right, this Tuesday, so literally today, right, we don't have a lab on this Tuesday, but we are going to do a lab on topographic maps on Wednesday, and we'll do another lab on minerals on Thursday. So no lab on the first day of class, but we will have lab on Wednesday and Thursday of this week. The other thing I want to tell you about, too, is that every Monday you will have a PowerPoint to listen to, but you will also have a quiz. So every Monday you will have a quiz and the quiz opens at 10 a.m. and it is open until 11. Uh, the quiz is closed note, closed book, closed PowerPoint, right? Everything like that. Um, but what is uh, going to be on that quiz is the previous week's uh, lecture material. So you'll notice on our As You Learn site that right now every week already has its quiz loaded in. And you'll also notice that there is a review sheet showing you the topics that will be on the quiz every Monday. So, for example, this week we're going to have a class on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And then the following week on Monday, we'll have a quiz on the previous week's material. So each Monday you have a quiz at 10 a.m. If that time is not appropriate for you, for example, say that you work on a Monday or something like that, please, please, please let me know right away and I will move the time of your quiz to a different suitable time, either earlier or later on Monday. There will also be two exams, right? We'll have a midterm and a final. Um, the midterm is going to be the first you know, half of the semester, the lecture and lab topics and the final exam will be the second half. Um, the final exam is not technically cumulative in the sense that it doesn't cover the entire semester, but I do have to say it does build on some of the topics that we would have talked about for the midterm. So, um, but either way, there'll be a review sheet for both the midterm and the final exam. So you'll know exactly what's gonna be covered. Nothing should be a surprise. Um, we do have a policy in the department that lab attendance is critical. If you miss four lab periods, and that I mean literally like on the day that you miss the fourth lab period, you will not only fail the lab, but you fail the entire course. So that is a departmental policy. That's not a Dr. L policy. So if you miss four labs, right, if you get four misses, you fail the entire course. So really important that you show up to the labs you, um, I will go over the labs in the beginning of the lab period, then you can work at your own pace. If you guys want to work in breakout rooms and work together on labs, that's not a problem. Um, and what you'll notice too is that we'll just have these little short exit quizzes that you guys can do. Once you feel pretty comfortable with the information in the lab, just go on to As You Learn, take the exit quiz, and then you can go ahead and leave the lab. Last but not least, I've had students in previous semesters ask, couldn't we do something that's not an exam or a lab that would help us gain some points? And so um, I've come up with a project where you guys do a uh, analysis of environmental geology in the movies. So if you look on As You Learn, I think it's in the last topic, there is a project where I'm going to have you guys um, do some research about a recent environmental geology movie. So like The Martian or something like that and do a little bit of uh, investigating on whether the premises in the movie are correct or not correct. Um, so it's kind of a lot of fun, but it also gets us into kind of something, um, uh, I guess, critical analysis, critical thinking of the way that environmental geology is presented, at least in the movies. So hopefully that should be uh, at least a little bit of, of fun for you too, just to kind of see how, um, how things tease out in, uh, on the big screen, so to speak. So first of all, we want to think about, you know, what is geology? When you think of the word geology, what comes to mind? OK, don't think about it. What just came to mind? Almost always, what do we get? Right. Is that what you thought of? 
almost always people are like, whenever I hear the word geology, what do I think of? Okay, I think of rocks. Okay, but what is the actual definition of geology? More importantly, right, geology, yes, the most popular usually is the word rock that comes up, but geology is also a lot of things. If we literally break down the word, right, geo, earth, ology, study of. So we're literally looking at the study of the earth, which is one of the second biggest uh, uh thoughts that comes up. So a lot of people think of geology as like, you know, rocks and um, uh, earth processes. They might think of volcanoes and things like that, but they think of um, a lot of the terms that are shown here, right? Um, other people think of geology as, well, I think more of, of resources, right? Like I think of drilling and I think of coal and I think of oil and I think of fossil fuels and things like that. So there's a whole other realm of folks that think that geology has to just do with the resources that we can pull from the earth. And then there's a lot of other people who kind of like the, um, the kind of planetary side of things, thinking about not only our own planet and the weather and the, the changes that are going on with our own planet, but then also too the planets like um, uh, Jupiter and Venus and other planets that are in our solar system along with the meteorites and whatever how uh, all of those were either formed or how they relate to each other. But I think for me too, the, the basic thing that we wanna send home here is that while this is a geology class, it's also first and foremost, a science class. And so we're gonna learn today a little bit about um, the scientific method, what is a scientific theory, um, how we can separate kind of fact from fiction as we're talking about uh, the whole field of science um, and uh, kind of scientific curiosity. The other thing too that we have to define is what is the environment, right? Certainly important because we're talking about environmental geology. So the environment, of course, a lot of people think of, I don't know why Canada popped up as one of the biggest um, words that came with this. This is probably a, a Canadian um, uh, uh, a word puzzle, but um, a lot of people think about what is the environment, but generally, I think Albert Einstein said, said it the best, the environment is everything that is not me. That's a great way of kind of putting that. The environment is everything that is around you. And there is the natural environment, right? Um, the biosphere, the water, the air, the whatever else. But then there's also the kind of built environment, right? The actual uh, constructed environment that's around us. So we really wanna kind of look at this interplay between um, earth, earth processes, the environment, but also humans. And the way that we do that, of course, is to by, uh, you know, developing policies, developing um, best practices for how we can interact with the environment, but leave it as a sustainable system, right, in order to use the environment for what we need it for presently, but then also to, um, to leave it in uh, as best shape as we can for future generations. So we don't want to hinder the ability of future generations to use that environment. Uh, sustainability, therefore, is a very important um, concept associated with environmental geology as well as sustainable development. And that's this idea here, too, that, you know, you're using the environment for what you need it for right now, but that you're also uh, keeping an eye towards the future and how future generations are going to also need to use the environment. Oh, carbon dioxide, this is definitely something that a lot of people come up with when they think of environment. You see greenhouse gases here, um, research associated with climate change and all of that, certainly going to be an important part of environmental geology. And we will kind of end the summer semester talking about um, uh, greenhouse gases, climate change, and how the um, human population is affecting the um, climate system, at least on our planet. So there's tons of different subdisciplines of um, geology. Environmental geology is just one of them, but there's physical geology, um, geophysics, there's uh, climate scientists, marine geology, oceanography. Um, and so there's a lot of different subdisciplines of geology. So we're gonna be kind of bringing in information from a whole bunch of different subdivisions of science to try to kind of build this synergistic view of the planet, right? Because there's a lot of different earth systems that are going to come together and act as one giant earth system to create the planet that we know and interact with today. So we're gonna talk about environmental geology, right? We're gonna focus on using geologic information, right? Geologic information, these are observations that we can make 
of the environment and the planet around us. And we're going to use that information to help solve problems or conflicts that humans have with respect to things like land use, minimizing hazards, and maximizing the benefits of using the environment while having a view, of course, right towards the future and sustainability. So we're going to kind of use the scientific method to make observations about how the planet works presently and how it has worked in the past, but then kind of use that to create best practices or to create policies about how we can uh, successfully manage the way that we use the planet uh, with an eye towards the future. There are several key concepts that we're going to be talking about in terms of um, environmental geology. And I think the first one that we're gonna to need to talk about, of course, is human population growth. And I'll show you that on the next slide, how rapidly uh, human populations are increasing. And of course, then you can manage, you can imagine, excuse me, the stresses that that puts on the environment. I've also talked a little bit too about sustainability and this idea of kind of using resources now, but with an eye towards the future and what future generations are going to need. And a sustainable practice is something that we, um, we employ to use resources right now, but not deplete those resources for future generations. At the end of today's class, I'm gonna talk a little bit about earth systems and change within those systems. We'll talk about earth processes and kind of define hazards versus risks. And then of course, to discuss the scientific method, how do we actually gain scientific knowledge? And then how do we use that to kind of make predictions about how earth systems are going to change in the future? The current population of earth is about 7.8 billion people. Uh, so I clipped this uh, literally off the internet just last week on the 20th of May. So 7.785 billion people currently uh, across the planet. And you'll notice that uh, the top five populous countries, China being number one, India number two, the U.S. coming in at number three, Indonesia number four, and uh, Pakistan actually has now edged out Brazil as number five. So current population about 7.8 billion people. Um, the human population grew slowly for hundreds of thousands of years, but we're now seeing huge exponential growth. Notice down here, we hit the first 1 billion people in the year 1830. Then about 130 years later, right, in 1960, we hit 2 billion people. So we doubled in about 130 years. Notice that now we then added the next 1 billion people just in the next 30 years. So you'll, the uh, rate of change is increasing exponentially now. So think about the implications of population growth that we can see in the future. And if we switch to a, um, a diagram that looks something like this, I have to erase all of my lines here so that this goes away, you'll notice that you know population was relatively low for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, but then we started to slowly increase as we get up towards the 1900s, and then notice this now exponential rise that we see in populations, and that our population now sits somewhere up here, right, at about 7.8 billion. So notice uh, the exponential change, but also I want to draw your attention to a couple of things here. What do you think these little dips are, right? Where would there be uh, reasons to see worldwide global uh, population decreases? Well, one of those could be disease, right? A lot of those actually are associated with disease. If we have plague or um, a large um, spread of disease where there are uh, hundreds of thousands of people who have succumbed to that disease. And the other big drop uh, is usually um, World War I and World War II. We actually see significant drops in population. But so aside from some of those dips uh, where we've either had disease uh, or uh, world wars, we have seen a general trend of population increasing um, through time. And it's now it seems to be changing on an exponential growth pattern. So the impacts of human population, right, is of course the population is getting bigger. We're seeing problems in a variety of different um, 
uh, economic as well as socioeconomic systems. Of course, food supply is going to become shortened, right? It's going to become a lot easier, excuse me, a lot more difficult to find certain types of uh, food supplies, especially when there is now increased demand and decreased supply. Um, so we'll also have problems too with a demand for resources, specifically those that are non-renewable. Non-renewable resources are things that are not able to be replenished, at least within, say, a human lifetime. So a, uh, fossil fuels are good examples of non-renewable resources. Uh, yes, they do keep forming, but they certainly don't form on a time scale that is usable for current populations, right? It takes, you know, potentially millions of years for uh, things like coal or oil to form. So if we're using them at a rate of, you know, billions of barrels of oil uh, per year or every couple of years, it certainly is not going to be able to replenish. One of the problems too that we're seeing, especially in arid regions, is the uneven distribution of both people as well as resources. Uh, in arid regions, water is actually the big issue, right? Because there are people that live in arid regions, but there's very, very little water. So one of the things that has been discussed is privatizing water. So for example, people who have, countries who have large water supplies uh, could then privatize countries, uh, excuse me, companies that would then sell that water to countries that don't have it. And of course, you know, you can actually start to think about all of the political as well as economic uh, issues that could go along with, well, if the price of water goes up and we can't afford it, what happens to the people in our country? Uh, this actually is a big issue right now closer to home. For example, the Rio Grande River flows through Colorado, New Mexico before it goes into Mexico. Right now, um, people in Colorado and communities in uh, New Mexico are using a lot of water from the Rio Grande River. Well, what does that mean for folks in Mexico who rely on the Rio Grande River for their water also? If Colorado and New Mexico up their use of the water, then that means that folks downriver, especially in Mexico, don't have the water resource. So lots of issues going on with that. And of course, a lot of that can uh, lead to a disruption of the natural systems, right? We can actually see uh, water usage and whatever else. For example, that my idea of Colorado and New Mexico using too much water from the Rio Grande, that can cause the Rio Grande to dry up completely, which then of course deprives the folks downstream of using that water. So um, lots of different impacts of this human population growth not only with respect to food supply, but then also the resources that are associated with uh, areas that are populated and are not populated. We're seeing a lot of this in headlines across the news. Let me erase these real quickly so you can kind of see this, right? Human-induced deforestation is causing an increase in malaria. So we're also seeing that, you know, increased human populations and the demand for resources are also affecting the spread of diseases. Nitrogen contained in coral shows that human impact is significantly changing the ocean chemistries. We know that, of course, with ocean acidification as well. Superbugs. The world is taking action, but low income, uh, income companies must not be left behind. This idea that we're using a lot of uh, drugs and antibiotics to treat germs and um, to treat diseases. But what that's doing is creating um, uh, medication resistant um, super viruses, super bugs. And so, of course, a lot of low income countries that won't have the ability to pay for some of those drugs are certainly going to be hit the hardest from some of those diseases. And of course, you know, we'll talk too about the evidence of global warming can no longer be ignored. Um, the data showing, of course, that our interaction with the environment and our use of things like fossil fuels is certainly uh, uh, used by a lot of um, countries, China and the U.S. are two, and India are three, I should say, of the biggest fossil fuel using countries. But of course, then global warming becomes a global problem, not just for the countries that are using those fossil fuels. So um, we have to kind of think about how uh, environmental systems really do cross political boundaries and geographic boundaries um, and affect in, in essentially the entire world. So we talk about this idea of sustainability, right? Need, meeting the needs of the present, but without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Uh, sustainability, I think, is actually a word that's tossed around quite often and people uh, may not necessarily know what it actually means. 
Um, and so I've got just a couple of uh, quotes here from the EPA. Everything that we need for our survival and well-being depends directly or indirectly on the natural environment. So it's really important to understand that kind of, you know, we need to live right here in this uh, in this overlap zone between understanding what we need as an economy, what we need as a society, but also what the environment can provide and how we can actually use that environmental resource um, so that not only we can maintain the conditions that we need presently, um, but not to uh, kind of negatively impact the social or economic requirements of future generations. So we kind of we need to live somewhere in this kind of uh, overlap zone where we take into account not only what we need as an economy and as a society, but also what we can do um, with the environment so that not only present generations have what they need, but also so do future generations. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys know about this. I, I did see it uh, advertised recently. Um, but App State even has its own graduation pledge that's a sustainability graduation pledge. I'm not sure if you saw this here, but this was actually implemented uh, about a decade ago, um, and it's got this graduation pledge of social and environmental responsibility. I pledge to explore and take into account the social right, and environmental consequences and the civic and community responsibilities of any job or career that I consider and will work to improve these aspects for any organization for which I work. So this is literally part of the sustain.appstate.edu system. Uh, and those who take the pledge are honored by green ribbons and gowns for their graduation. So you do have the ability to take this pledge. Uh, and of course, it, it um, makes sense that then kind of, you know, we are uh, providing the opportunity for students to kind of make that commitment to be sustainable as they go out into the workforce post Appalachian. So keeping in mind all of those concepts that we just talked about, right, earth systems, uh, population growth, sustainability, all that stuff, the environment, we have to um, kind of talk about how we know what we think we know about the earth and the environmental system. And the way that we do that is um, through geology, right? So through studying what we think we know about the planet, and we do that by examining the rock record. So it is interesting. I actually found this. This was noticed. This was from an article in May 2016. 80% uh, of young environmental scientists could use more natural history training. Natural history, just another fancy word for kind of geologic or earth history. And so, you know, we think about this idea of like, oh, why would I take a geology class? Who cares about old rocks? You know, whatever else. Well, the reason why it's important to study the the fossil or the rock record is. We can see how the planet has behaved in the past. And of course, the idea there is once we understand how Earth systems work previously, we can kind of, you know, turn our view to the future and, I, and start to think about, OK, here's probably how things will react to similar environmental perturbations as we go forward. So let's talk a little bit about Earth history. The guiding principle that every geologist learns in like an intro geologic class is this idea of uniformitarianism. So if you took 1101, I know you heard this term, right? Uniformitarianism. The way that geologists explain this is this catchphrase of the present is the key to the past. It's the idea that we see earth processes happening today and we assume that those same processes uh, we're, we're working in the same way throughout the geologic past. So if we see, for example, here's a beautiful, here's a river, right, kind of cutting through uh, rock on the um, Colorado Plateau. And so if we are seeing that uh, rivers can cut down and erode rock, but it's an extremely slow process, and it takes, you know, thousands to millions of years, we can assume that that same process, that you know, slow wearing down of rock by water, uh, has occurred the same way throughout geologic time. So we can kind of reconstruct to say, okay, how long do we think it took for this river to cut back down into this, uh, this rock bedrock? Um, geologic processes that we observe today, many of them seem to be very slow. If you look at this landscape in 1871, and if I slowly then fade it into about 100 years later, you're going to notice that essentially not a whole lot changes, right? 
maybe just a little bit in terms of the, the level, right, the height or whatever, but not a whole lot changes. So the processes of things like weathering, erosion, movement of sediment, breakdown of rock, that is actually a pretty slow process. And so folks early on in the history of geology started to make those observations that processes seem pretty slow and that we can't have seen things that are extremely uh, large scale, for example, the depth of the Grand Canyon, that couldn't have happened very quickly if these processes of erosion are extremely slow and take you know, thousands to millions of years. Uniformitarianism was, uh, I shouldn't, it was kind of developed by this man named James Hutton. Okay, so James Hutton uh, came up with this idea of uniformitarianism, and he really made these observations that geologic processes are slow. So James Hutton's initial image of uniformitarianism was that all Earth processes are gradual. And this is really important because he was really one of the first individuals who kind of started thinking about what we would call deep geologic time, right? Deep time is, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions and even billions of years. Um, and so James Hutton's famous quote, uh, no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end, this is when he's talking about what is the age of the earth, right? The idea of his uniformitarianism suggested that gradual changes are what uh, shape the planet. And in order for those gradual changes to make huge differences, like we see in the geologic record, it would need to, uh, to mean that the planet has been around for enormous amounts of geologic time. That there's no vestige of a beginning of the time it took for the earth to change and no prospect of an end, right? We're starting to think about deep time rather than just human lifetimes. So James Hutton's idea was that all of Earth changes are gradual, but we know that that's not always true, right? There are lots of things that change the way the Earth looks, and they don't have to be gradual. We see huge volcanic eruptions, and they can happen uh, within days, they can happen within weeks. And we also, too, have seen things like meteorite impacts, um, and those things can happen essentially geologically instantaneously. So the idea of uniformitarianism has kind of now changed to something that we call actualism. And it does incorporate the idea of gradualism. There are lots of earth processes that are gradual, but it also takes into account that there are high energy events that are relatively rare during human lifespans, but they are relatively common over geologic time. So we're talking, you know, thousands to maybe, you know, millions of years that there are things like these volcanic eruptions or these big meteorite impacts. So the new uniformitarianism, this idea of actualism, really suggests that there are gradual changes and every once in a while we also do have these very rapid changes as well. All of those are working together to shape the surface of the planet. So rather than thinking about, you know, just time in terms of human lifetimes, right, you know, tens of years, maybe a hundred years, we're going to kind of now need to think about time uh, on a very broad scale. We're going to need to really ramp up the number of zeros that we put on our time scale up into the billions of year range, because when we talk about the Earth, we're going to say that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. So lots of zeros going on there. But we're also going to need to talk about things on the order of maybe days and hours. And when eventually when we talk about, uh, say, like nuclear reactors or uh, radioactive decay, we're going to get down to some really, really, really short time frames. So rather than kind of just using our idea of time as measured in, you know, years to maybe at max 100 years, we really need to kind of broaden our idea of time now into deep time, right, really old stuff. But then also remember that some geologic processes happen extremely rapidly, right, on the order of, you know, thousands to millionths of a second. Okay, so imagine that you are uh, living in 450 BC or whatever, and you see an outcrop of rock with a skeleton that is, uh, you don't know it's a dinosaur necessarily, but you do know that it's something that you've never seen before, and it's huge. You can think about you know, how folks would have explained it back in 450 BC. 
a lot of times, right, that was, it was was um, explained using uh, religious um, interpretations that the suggestion was that it was that the gods put it there or things like that. Um, and so that was some of the early uh, theories about how there were things that seemed to be in the earth, um, but that couldn't be explained necessarily by the current state of science. Uh, in the Middle Ages, right, I know we're jumping, but in the Middle Ages uh, was when we actually had uh, people really thinking about the age of the earth and how do we figure out just how old the earth is. Well, this gentleman here is James Usher, and he was an archbishop uh, in the 1650s, and he used the Bible and counted up essentially all of the generations that were found in the biblical texts, and he was able to determine that the earth was probably formed, according to the Bible, on October 23rd, 4004 BC. In fact, he was so amazing about this that he figured out it was a Thursday. So the earth was actually formed October 23rd, 4004 BC, just according to the data that could be collected from the Bible. While this is, you know, putting a 6,000 year age on the earth, right, that is definitely um, uh, a, a underestimation as we know now, but of course it's a great way for people in the Middle Ages to really start to think about, it's not that the earth is just on the order of, you know, tens to hundreds of years, it's certainly on the order of thousands of years. Um, and so people started to really think in the Middle Ages that the age of the earth was at least the length of human history, and shortly after the 1650s, we got into the Renaissance. In the Renaissance, lots of people started to have kind of hip groovy ideas about the, the planet and about how things were changing around them. You remember that Renaissance means rebirth. And so this gentleman here on the right, this is Nicholas Stenson, and a lot of people remember him as Nicholas Steno, uh, also a man of the church, but he really started to think that instead of Usher's idea of uh, the Earth being formed 4004 BC, maybe the Earth is significantly older. Steno made some observations that were pretty groundbreaking, no pun intended, but um, he came up with this principle of solid within a solid. Imagine that you see, right, a fossil. So here's a shark's tooth, and the shark's tooth itself is a solid, right? It's hard, it's, it's a hard thing, and it is sitting inside it is actually encased or enveloped by something else that is a solid, and in this case, it's rock. Stina looked at this and tried to figure out how, how on earth could you get a solid within a solid? In fact, he the only way he could uh, figure this out was that this was a solid at one point, but at one point, this must have been fluid or plastic soft enough to accept whatever this solid thing in it is, and then this outer part must have hardened to then create the solid within a solid. So Steno really started to kind of revolutionize the idea of geology that if you see a pebble inside another rock, or if you see a fossil inside a rock, it probably was that the pebble or the fossil was a solid that was, took a significant amount of time to be then incorporated into whatever is around it when it was soft and then the whole system hardened. Steno also kind of looked at solids within a solid from the fossil aspect to say, okay, cool, this looks like a remnant of something that doesn't live today. So maybe it is what we call a fossil and it is an ancient form of an organism and that that organism now no longer exists so that it is now extinct. In fact, Steno uh, did see quite a few shark's teeth uh, in his travels and was trying to figure out what they might have been. Now he hadn't seen sharks, so he wasn't sure that the teeth were coming from sharks, but what he did think they were, were the fossilized uh, turned to stone uh, ancient tongues of dragons. In fact, so Steno thought that uh, shark's teeth were what he called tongue stones. They were the ancient replaced tongues of dragons that had over long periods of geologic time been turned into stone. Now we know that that's of course not true and instead, right, they're actually teeth from ancient sharks. But it is a, uh, a kind of great way to understand that something that you see in the fossil record may be a remnant of an ancient life form that no longer exists. 
Steno kept going with this idea uh, of solids within a solid by coming up with three major principles that we're going to use a lot over the next couple of days of class. Steno's principles are a way to figure out what we call relative chronology. Relative is meaning what happened relative to another event. So for example, this happened first, this happened second, and so on. So Steno's principles of relative chronology are superposition, original horizontality, and lateral continuity. Now, what do these actually mean? Steno's principle of superposition says that when you see rocks that are stacked or layered on top of each other, the rocks at the bottom must be oldest and had to be there first, and that the rocks layered on top must be younger and had to be deposited after. So the idea here, super above, right? Super means above. Position is that rock units that sit up higher are younger than the rocks that sit below. You can think of it this way, right? I always relate everything to food. You've got to put the base layer on the cake before you can put the frosting in the middle and then the next layer of cake on top of it. Steno also noticed that there is what he called a principle of original horizontality. Most geologic systems tend to lay rocks down in a horizontal flat-lying sheets. So most rocks should be deposited as horizontal flat-lying sheets of rock. Now, however, it seems that over geologic time, those horizontal sheets can get changed and folded and warped but they were initially originally horizontal. And if they are not horizontal anymore, we can say that some sort of event has actually changed them from horizontal to now be a different shape. Last but not least, he came up with this idea of lateral continuity. So it suggests that rock units not only are laid down as horizontal sheets, but that those horizontal sheets are laterally continuous, right? That they would be across broad regions. And even if something has eroded down, for example, even if a river cuts down into um, a set of layered rock, the rock on one side should match up with the rock on the other side. So this is the idea that rocks are laterally continuous even when there is erosion showing missing rock in between. Really important because now using Steno's principles, we can kind of start to reconstruct Earth's history, right? We can say that rocks on the bottom are old and rocks at the top are young. We can say too that rocks are originally laid down horizontally. And if they're no longer horizontal, right? We know that after they were laid down as horizontal sheets, they've now been folded or warped. And lastly, by lateral continuity, we can say that rocks were originally laterally continuous, but even though now they've been cut by later erosion, right? That erosion had to have happened after the rocks that were laterally continuous had already been laid down. So it's a good way for us to kind of figure out how events in Earth history happen in terms of relative chronology. So if you look at a diagram like this, you can start to kind of figure out the sequence of events. So what happened first, what happened second, and what happened third? Usually when a geologist looks at a diagram like this, in order to figure out what happened first, we usually go to the bottom of the diagram. We do that because of, right, superposition. If superposition is true, the rocks that are the oldest or the things that happened first should be found at the bottom. And so the first thing that seems to have happened here in this scenario is that the sedimentary rock was laid down as horizontal sheets. And specifically, this rock was laid down first, then this one, then this one, and so on and so forth. Makes sense, right? All the way up to about here. Now, what seems to have happened after that? Which came next? The erosion or the intrusion? And how do you know? Well, the intrusion, right? This stuff over here cuts this layered sedimentary rock. 
In order to cut the layered sedimentary rock, the layered sedimentary rocks had to be there. So the purple happened first, right? The sedimentary rocks were laid down and then they were cut by the intrusion. Now we know too, look over here, the intrusion is cut by the erosion. And so the erosion must be younger than the intrusion. And so we can start to kind of put together a sequence of events that here, first thing is the sedimentary rocks. The second thing, of course, then would be the intrusion. And what happened last is that the sedimentary rocks and the intrusion were both cut by erosion. This is old, this is young. That would be a relative chronology, right? Because we're not putting what's the age of anything, we're not putting a number on it, but we are just saying what happened first, second, and third. So relative chronology is, believe it or not, the way that we developed the geologic time scale. People who were using Steno's principles all over the world were starting to put rocks in relative order, right? So here's over in North America, rock unit one was below rock unit two, three, and four. And so putting those in relative chronology said that, okay, rock unit one is older than two, three, and four. Well, then what they would do would be compare the rocks that they had in North America to rocks that they had, for example, in South America. And maybe in South America, they only had rock units three and four, but they noticed that above rock units three and four, they had rock units five, six, and seven. These overlapped. And so they could say, cool, these are the same rock types that we saw in North America, but then they could start to now see what rock units formed in younger geologic time. Based on this idea of kind of correlating rock units around the world, geologists developed the geologic time scale in the 19th century, totally by relative ages, totally just by saying relative chronology. These rocks were deposited first, these were second, these were third. And so we made the geologic time scale, which you may or may not have been introduced to in Geology 1101, but hopefully some of these things might look familiar to you, right? Here's those rock units that we learned about all across the world. And what we then did is we stacked them based on relative chronology, saying these are old and these are young. And then we gave them names based on where a lot of these rock units had their most uh, or best, I should say, uh, exposures. So we then started to name that these rocks, right, older than this uh, zone would be called the Precambrian rocks. And then we would then start to name the rocks that would fit in these relative time periods uh, with the longest amount of time period being an eon, the next longest, the next, I said shortest time period is an era. The next shortest time period is called a period. And the shortest time period is called an epoch or epoch. I don't know if you guys had to memorize the geologic time scale for your 1101 class, but this is where all of the names came from. And it was developed in the geologic time scale before we even knew how to put numerical numbers on uh, rocks. James Hutton is known as the father of modern geology. Now we already introduced Hutton because we reminded ourselves that he came up with this idea of uniformitarianism and deep time. So this was in the late 1700s that uh, Hutton really makes popular this idea of uniformitarianism and really starts to get people thinking about this idea of slow geologic processes taking long periods of geologic time. Uh, this individual over here, this is uh, Charles Lyell, and in the 1830s, Lyell actually had um, a close relationship with Charles Darwin, and the two of them were uh, discussing a lot of um, geologic principles as well as biological principles, and um, Charles Lyell actually wrote a book called The Principles of Geology, where he really um, spent a lot of time discussing Hutton's idea of uniformitarianism. So these are some important individuals kind of in the, the history of Earth um, history and how their ideas really started to develop what we now know uh, in terms of modern geological um, principles. 
And it wasn't, believe it or not, until the uh, early 1900s that we really started to understand how we make um, measurements of um, radioisotopic decay in order to put numerical dates on the geologic time scale. So remember, we had the geologic time scale developed based solely on relative chronology, and it really wasn't until radiometric dating took off in the late 1950s that we started to put actual numbers on the age of the Earth. The age of the Earth is 4.6, 4.6 billion years. It's actually 4.568, oh, excuse me, 4.54, but that's okay. We can round that up to about 4.6 billion years ago. <clears throat> It's important to remember too that the two time scales, right, the one that was developed early based on relative time and the one that was then developed later based on numerical dates are very complementary. The dates that we use to measure the age of those rock units do uh, support the numeric, excuse me, the relative time scale. So relatively speaking, the Cambrian rocks should be older than the Ordovician rocks. And when we numerically dated them, we found that that was very true. As our methods are getting better, and as we're learning how to do radiometric dating um, much more precisely, some of the ages on some of these rock units is changing a little bit, but it is still um, testing the hypotheses of the uh, relative time scale. And so far, um, our relative time scale seems to be working pretty well. So we've got now numbers on our geologic time scale. That's the kind of amalgamation of not only the relative time, uh, but also the numerical time that we've put on it. And there's our age of the earth, right? 4.54 billion years old, or you can round that up to 4.6 billion years old. <clears throat> This is about 51 minutes, by the way. So if you want to take a break, this would be a great time to do it. Uh, you can just go ahead and exit out of this, take a break. Normally what we would do in class is I would do the first 45 to 50 minutes. I'd let you guys take a break and then we'd come back and do the second half of class. So if you wanna do that now, that might be a really good time to do that. If you wanna keep continuing, we can go on and you can finish this uh, and we'll continue talking a little bit more about earth history. What we're gonna talk about in this class uh, is a lot of the stuff that's been going on kind of in the recent geologic history, but in order to understand recent geologic history and also kind of how the future of the planet is going to be, we really do need to understand all of Earth history. And so while we often talk about kind of environmental geologic problems as something that happens mainly in the present, right? Things that happen on the order of maybe uh, decades to uh, centuries or longer, it is really important to understand the full, right, 4.6 billion years worth of Earth history because many of these environmental problems have popped up naturally throughout geologic history and we can understand how processes change through time if we understand how they worked in the past. For example, our first evidence of erosion of rock by water 3.8 million, excuse me, 3.8 billion years ago. We've had erosion by water for 3.8 billion years. We can actually now study how water has eroded rock throughout Earth history to see how it will maybe change as we get uh, more and more ice melting, creating more liquid water, and that liquid water starting to now um, carve into the surface of the Earth. We also have, here's the initial rise of oxygen in the atmosphere. Prior to that, most of the atmosphere had a lot of things like carbon dioxide and methane in it. We can look at how um, the natural systems reacted to high levels of CO2 and methane and use that to then also predict how will the planet look as um, methane and CO2 values continue to increase in the future. So how do we know what we think we know about Earth history? Essentially, we do it by looking at the rock record, right? We actually look at geologic time as it is preserved in Earth's rocks. And we're looking at the rock system, which is essentially what we call the lithosphere, right? The sphere of rock that is uh, enveloping the planet. 
And by looking at the lithosphere, we can reconstruct a lot of other Earth systems. Specifically, we can look at the uh, animals and plants that have lived, the biosphere. We can look at how water has interacted with the planet. We can look at what's called the hydrosphere. We can look at the presence of ice. We'll call that the cryosphere. And we can also look at how the uh, gas envelope around the planet has changed. So we can call that the atmosphere. So what we know about Earth history is essentially through the interaction of a variety of what we call Earth systems. We investigate Earth systems, as any good scientist does, by using what's called the scientific method. Hopefully, in 1101, you all looked at the scientific method. <clears throat> The scientific method is driven by observations and experiments. Essentially, you are going to create data. The data that you're creating is by doing an experiment and making observations. Any good scientific method investigation starts out with a hypothesis, right? It's an idea. You make an observation and you come up with a question. That question then says, okay, great. Uh, I propose that this happens because of that. Okay, so that's our hypothesis. We start out with our question. What we then do after we start with our hypothesis is we then make observations and collect data, right? Make observations and collect data. That should be step number two. We're going to challenge our hypothesis, right, with our data and observations. And we can now go one of two ways. Does the data support our hypothesis? If no, then what we want to do is we want to go back to the drawing board and we want to revise our hypothesis or we want to discard it completely because our data indicates that our hypothesis was completely wrong. If, however, the data and observations that we make do support the uh, hypothesis, we continuously test that hypothesis, and if data and observations continue to support that hypothesis, it may become something that we call a scientific theory. A scientific theory is something that has been supported by continuous challenges, right? continuous rigorous testing, and has still been supported by copious data. So theories, rather than being something that a lot of people say, oh, that's just a theory, right? In science, a theory is something that has been um, continuously supported by a large amount of data. So the scientific method is the way we've done things since the 17th century. We identify the problem. We then make our hypothesis, right? We then develop our hypothesis here in step number one. We challenge that hypothesis by collecting data and making observations. We then kind of propose, does that hypothesis make sense based on the data? Does it make sense based on the data? Maybe not. And so we can either then validate that hypothesis or revise it if necessary. So I like to play this little game about, you know, let's kind of use the scientific method to, um, to talk about whether the earth is flat or round. So let's go ahead and start with the hypothesis that the Earth is flat. So if we have this hypothesis, we would say that the North Pole is right here, whoops, and that this is actually Antarctica all around the outer part of the flat Earth. North Pole in the middle right here, all of the continents kind of sitting on a flat rotating disk. Okay, so what observations could we make or have we made in the past <clears throat> to say that the Earth is flat? Well, believe it or not, there's plenty of people who have made observations that seem to suggest that there are data to support that the Earth is flat. They happen to not be scientists, for example, Shaquille O'Neal, but there are plenty of observations that people make that says that the Earth is flat. Let's look at some of these observations. Here's one, no matter how high I climb up, the horizon always seems flat. Therefore, the Earth is flat. Okay, that looks like an interesting uh, observation. Um, I'm sorry, Shaq, but I do have to pick on you a little bit here. This is a direct quote from him in February 2017. When I drive from Florida to California, it seems flat to me. Okay, that's great. 
Um, the bottom of clouds are flat. The world looks flat. My senses tell me, therefore, that the earth is flat. Hmm. Okay, that's an interesting observation. I measured the level of the ocean for six miles. It's not curved. Okay, therefore, cool, it's flat. Uh, and here's another one that I absolutely love. I took a level on an airplane. I proved that the earth is flat. Some guy said this in 2018. Okay, so these are observations, right? Yes, and these observations do seem to support, right, that the earth is flat. But the great thing about science is that everybody should be able to test that hypothesis and all the data from those tests should continuously support your hypothesis. Are there other observations that we can make that say that the earth is not flat? Of course. For centuries, we believed that the earth was flat. Okay, I get it. It looks flat. We also thought that the earth was stationary. Man, it would be so windy, right, if we were hurtling through space. And we also thought for centuries that the earth was the center of the universe and that the planets and the sun revolved around us, right? Everything in the night sky, the stars, the planets seem to revolve around us and the sun rises and sets each day around us. These were hypotheses at the time and they worked because those were the actual observations that could be made at that time. We now know, of course, that as science progresses and technology gets better, uh, we can make better or different observations, and we've now proved that these hypotheses are incorrect, right? Do lunar eclipses look like this, right? If we've got essentially the Earth located between the sun and the moon, if the Earth was flat, this is what a lunar eclipse would look like. And is that true no of course not because now we know that the earth is round in fact we now have satellites that can actually go out into space and look back at our planet and other planets to see that the earth is round so one thing that's great about science is that we're constantly testing we're constantly revising our hypotheses as data and technologies get better and better so one thing that's important to remember about scientific um, theories is that I know that when a lot of people say, oh, the theory of evolution, well, that's just your theory. Well, I think we're confusing the different definitions of the term theory. In kind of popular vernacular, right, just kind of everyday language, we use the definition of a theory here, right, a mere conjecture or a guess. But in science, our use of the word theory is very, very different. In science, a theory is an idea that is supported again and again by data and observation. So it has been tested by the scientific method and it has withstood rigorous testing. So to be clear, a scientific theory is not something that we're unsure about. Instead, it is a well substantiated explanation of some aspect of the natural world, and I would put on here too, supported by data, right? Supported by observable and repeatable evidence. So when we're gonna talk about the theory of plate tectonics and the theory of evolution, these are ideas that are well substantiated and they explain uh, natural occurrences in the world through repeatable and observable evidence. <clears throat> the cool thing about science is that science, the scientific method is what we would say is unprejudiced, right? You don't have to believe me. You can actually go ahead and do the experiment yourself and you can test the result. One thing that we would actually um, suggest, though, is that science, regardless of who does it, should be observable and repeatable. And that's this idea of continuous rigorous testing. The other thing that's important about this is that this is why scientific research, uh, when it is published, goes through a very difficult and rigorous process of what we call peer review, right? When you propose an idea or an explanation for some of your data, your peers have to be able to look at that and make sure that yes, the data that you um, are reporting is observable and repeatable and therefore it does support your hypothesis. <clears throat> I think Neil deGrasse Tyson says this best. 
When different experiments give you the same result, it is no longer subject to your opinion. That's the great thing about science. It's true whether you believe in it or not. That's why science works. So this is a kind of a, a just a good take home message here that the nature of science is that it is repeatable and observable. And you don't have to like the person who's doing the, the um, research. You literally could do the research project yourself. And if you get the same result, then you actually have once again supported the hypothesis. So using the scientific method, we're able to now make observations of our universe and of our planet to try to figure out how the universe formed and then how the planets in our solar system formed and create hypotheses that can continuously be tested through observations um, to now explain kind of the origins of both the universe and our solar system. Uh, I have a link here to a little YouTube video if you wanna just watch kind of a couple of quick little minutes on this, but um, we're gonna go through how we know um, the age of the universe to be about 13.8 uh, billion years. So if you see me right, GA means giga annum, that is for billions of years. So the age of the universe is around 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, once again, you'll notice I do have a slight academic crush on Neil deGrasse Tyson. And so here is another great quote of his. The atoms of our bodies are traceable to stars that manufactured them in their cores and exploded these enriched ingredients across our galaxy billions of years ago. For this reason, we are biologically connected to every other living thing in the world. We are chemically connected to all molecules on Earth, and we are atomically connected to all atoms in the universe. We are not figuratively, but instead we are literally stardust. I think that's a really kind of cool way to bring this home that literally the atoms that were formed in supernovae way back in the earliest history of our universe are what make up our bodies right now. So there really is this sense of interconnectedness between all both natural biological systems as well as chemical and um, atomical systems. The Big Bang Theory is what we use to explain the origins of the universe. Again, remember, we're using the term theory here as something that has been tested by the scientific method and has withstood rigorous observation and data collection. The Big Bang Theory suggests that about 13.8 billion years ago, all uh, matter in the solar system was condensed into an extremely tiny, small, super dense, super hot singularity, literally the size of a head of a pin. Uh, this singularity went through rapid uh, inflation, I won't say explosion, but rapid inflation, expanding from the size of a single atom to that of a grapefruit in the tiniest fraction of a second. And as you look at this diagram here <clears throat> from National Geographic, uh, what you'll notice is that as we go through, here's you know time right here, here's the temperature of the universe. Then after uh, you know just fractions of a second, one second doesn't even come till right over in here. We uh, just within fractions of a second, we start to now cool down this inflation uh, enough to start getting things like protons and neutrons to form. After three minutes after the inflation, we're still too hot to form atoms. But then by about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe is about 10,000 degrees centigrade. Electrons are starting to combine with protons and neutrons to form atoms. And what are the first atoms that we're gonna form? They're gonna be the first very simple atoms from the periodic table, specifically hydrogen and helium. So hydrogen atoms are gonna form and helium, helium atoms are gonna form as well in the first couple of hundreds of thousands of years. And it's not even until after the first say billion years or so that temperatures get down into about the minus 200 degrees C where gravity really starts to take over and starts to pull the hydrogen and helium gases together to start to form what we would see are some things called nebulae. So nebulae are going to be kind of the building materials of what will eventually make our galaxies. 
And it's not until, say, 15 billion years where we actually start to see galaxies starting to form where they have things that are solid in them like stars and planets. So the Big Bang Theory explains the origin of the universe, right? This idea that all matter in the, in the universe was condensed into a singularity some 13.8 billion years ago. And it's not up until we get into step six and step seven that we now switch to something called the nebula hypothesis, which then attempts to explain how our solar system formed. The nebula hypothesis suggests that, you know, 13 to 14 billion years ago, a nebula started to form from the hydrogen and helium atoms that were left over from the Big Bang. Okay, what is a nebula? A nebula is just a cloud of gases. As gravity starts to uh, develop in our early solar system, nebulas actually start to condense and get squished into kind of this swirling disk. They're gonna start to kind of move around and the center part of the disk is going to actually get very dense and very hot. Remember, as this stuff starts to swirl, right, as this nebula starts to move, dense things are going to set, uh, go towards the middle and light gases are going to go towards the outside. So the central zone right in here is going to grow dense and hot and fusion reactions. Remember what a fusion reaction is, right? Atoms smashing into other atoms. OK, we're going to kind of fuse those together. So fusion reactions are going to start to now happen. And over long periods of time, we're going to create a star at the center of that swirling nebula. And that's going to become the sun. Dust or solid particles that are found in the rings around that star will eventually also start to coalesce as initially just gas atoms um, smash together in fusion reactions those atoms start to now kind of continuously fuse with other atoms till we eventually get up into solid dust particles. And eventually, over time, more and more collisions are going to make now those little dust particles come into pieces of rock. Those rock particles now collide and become small, early baby planets, which we'll call planetesimals. Planetesimals will eventually look like bigger things, right? Maybe like asteroids, something like this. And again, these things are going to continuously be colliding, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And once they collide with each other over time, they are going to eventually get very hot. The hotter they get, right, the interior parts of these little planetesimals is going to be really, really hot. So as they get hotter and hotter, what's going to happen is, is that they're going to become soft and gravity is going to take over. Dense things are going to sink towards the middle part of the planetesimal. Light things are going to be on the edge. And because they're soft, they're going to start to resemble a sphere. So gravity reshapes kind of these little planetesimals into what will become eventually proto-Earth and then all the other planets in the solar system. And the sinking of dense material towards the center part of the planet is going to start to give us two different layers, a core and a mantle. Early Earth, right, around 4 billion years ago, doesn't look like Earth as it is today. Early Earth would have just had two layers where the center part would have been very dense iron rich material and the lighter material would have been kind of in the outside. So we would have had an iron rich core and kind of a lighter mantle on the outside. Now we know, of course, that the Earth has several other layers now. It's got a solid core a fluid outer core, a kind of plastic mantle, and then a rigid crust on the outside. But of course, this differentiation didn't happen until much later in Earth history. At around 4 billion years ago, Earth still looked very um, simple with just maybe a two-layer system like we're showing on the left here. At that same time, around 4.5 billion years ago, Earth actually collided with another early planet. Um, that early planet we call Thea. That planet that, that collided with the Earth did a couple of things. Earth's rotational axis was probably straight up and down before the collision with Thea. 
What happened afterwards is that after Thea slammed into Earth, the rotational axis of the Earth actually got tilted over to about 23 degrees. And the other thing that happened is that all the ejected material that came out of Earth from the damage of the collision with Thea eventually became a ring of debris around the Earth that kind of grew together and stuck together like a space dust bunny and eventually became our moon. So the age of the Earth that we're gonna use for this class, 4.54 billion years ago. The moon, right, formed shortly after the Earth became solid as we had this collision with Thea. So we have an Earth system with a tilted rotational axis, thanks to Thea. And only after we now have a solid cold Earth could we eventually get an atmosphere and a hydrosphere developing to create the blue planet that we see today. So I've just essentially taken four and a half billion years and um, done, <laughs> done it in two slides. But you can imagine that, you know, it takes a long period of geologic time for the Earth to become what it was when it first formed 4.5 billion years ago to what it is that we see today here in the present. Now, if we have a hypothesis, right, this is the nebula hypothesis. That's what I'm using my shorthand here. What is the evidence that supports the nebula hypothesis? Why do scientists think that this hypothesis that I just told you about explains how the Earth and our solar system formed? Well, do we see nebulae today? Absolutely. I'll show you some beautiful pictures of them on the next slide. But thanks to things like the Hubble telescope, we've seen gorgeous examples of um, nebulae, those gas clouds existing today. And even within those gas clouds, we see that there are dense hot centers where stars are starting to form. We also see that uh, the nebula hypothesis makes sense because all of the planets in our solar system seem to rotate along the same coincidental plane around our central star, which is the sun. So it suggests that our early beginnings were as this kind of swirling disk of dense hot gases, and that from those rotational arms around our central sun, that's where we formed all of our planets in our solar system. So we also know too that we do see evidence of things colliding with each other, right? So we actually know that planetesimals can collide with each other because we see craters of collisions on the moon. We see uh, craters all over other planets like Mars and Mercury. So we know, <clears throat> excuse me, we know that there are um, bits of space rock that tend to slam into each other and kind of coalesce to make bigger and bigger pieces of space rock. And that also can suggest that we can make planetesimals over time just from all of the smaller pieces of rock that were once in space. Another thing too, once we started to get really good with our radiometric dating, what we did is we dated numerically all the meteorites that have been found on the planet. And what we noticed is that all meteorites are younger than this date, than 4.567 billion years ago. What that means is that we needed to have solid rock or solid planets forming in the universe by 4.567 billion years ago. Remember though, how do we form the Earth? We form the Earth by meteorites slamming into other meteorites, right? Coalescing all those meteorites. Therefore, we know that the Earth has to be younger than 4.567 billion years ago. And so that's where we come up with the age of the planet as 4.54 billion years old. The meteorites had to be there before they could coalesce to form the planet. The neat thing about meteorites too is that if we look at their composition, we can actually see how meteorites came together in different compositions 
to create some of the early planetesimals having that iron rich core and that uh, less dense mantle. So here's some good examples of nebulae. And if you want to kill a couple of hours, Google NASA's Hubble telescope images. They are absolutely stunning. Uh, these are just gas clouds, right? And you can see within these gas clouds, there are pockets, places where you've got uh, hotter, denser portions. These are the stars that are here. Here's two um, beautiful colliding galaxies, right? There's a spiral galaxy there. Looks like there may be another one over here, right, with its arms. But these are actually two colliding galaxies coming together here. Um, so we know that there are nebulae existing today. And so therefore, we certainly could have had nebula formed 15 um, billion years ago that could have been the building blocks of what made our solar systems. <clears throat> so we make our solar system out of these nebulae, right? And um, our observations show us that the first four planets here are called the rocky planets. So Earth, Venus, Mars, and Mercury are smaller, they're closer to the sun, and they seem to be uh, terrestrial or rocky planets. The planets that are further away from the sun, right, as we go out into the outer reaches of our solar system, right, poor Pluto is no longer a planet. I'm sorry, buddy. But these planets here are what we call the gas planets or the gas giants. Some people actually call these the Jovian planets, right? These are much, much larger than the rocky planets. And instead of having a rocky uh, core, these actually seem to have a huge envelope of gases around them. They seem to be gaseous planets. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are what we call gas giants. Well, the separation of the rocky planets and the gas giant planets also does support the nebula hypothesis. Remember how when we were saying that you had this swirling disk of gases, the dense stuff would be in the middle and the lighter stuff would be kind of on the outside of the swirling disk. That supports the idea that the planets that would have been inner, closer to <clears throat> the center part of the solar system would be rocky and would be more dense. And because of the centrifugal force of the swirling arms of the nebulae, the planets that formed on the outer parts of the solar system would be made of lighter materials, things like gases. So very interesting that you can actually even just look at the composition of the planets in our solar system. And that is another line of evidence that supports the nebula hypothesis. <clears throat> so we've made a planet, right? We now have an Earth. And we know too that the Earth works as a system. So we have components of the earth that function together to create a whole. The components are not completely independent of each other. In fact, if one of those components is disrupted, it will actually affect several of the other components in a variety of earth systems. So what do I mean by earth as a system? What are the components of earth system? Ooh, I forgot to put this here. First of all, I'll talk about Earth system in a second. I'm sorry, but why is it important to understand how those Earth systems work? It's because, remember, we've been talking about this the whole class today. We will be aware of how our actions now and in the future can affect the balance of those Earth systems. Those systems that essentially have been working for millennia uh, may react to uh, human interaction. And if those become out of balance, we might want to be able to predict how those are going to change. Going back to our idea of the environment and sustainability, <clears throat> it's very important to understand how Earth systems work so that we can be better stewards of the environment and propose sustainable practices going on in the future. We also are going to need, especially in the future, to understand how changes in Earth systems are going to affect us, especially in terms of environmental systems. As the planet begins to change, how are perturbations in those Earth systems going to affect the human population and what can we expect? So we're gonna look at a bunch of different Earth systems throughout this class. Here's the one I was looking for, which is what are the different Earth systems? 
You probably know from your uh, intro geology course that the Earth has multiple different layers. <laughs> we know that the Earth has a solid, right, inner core here. It has a liquid outer core here. And the two of those layers of the core, right, here's the inner core and the outer core, they actually work together to create a system called the geodynamo system. That's great, Dr. Luckus. What is the geodynamo system? Geo means earth, dynamo means self-perpetuating. So what we're talking about here in the geodynamo system is the, um, the generation of earth's magnetic field. And it has to do with the out, uh, inner core being very, very hot causing convection cells in the outer core, which is liquid, and the convection in the outer core, and we'll talk about this later, is what creates Earth's magnetic field. So that's one Earth system. It's the inner and outer core layers working with each other to create this self-perpetuating system that generates Earth's magnetic field. Very important that we have a magnetic field, right? Because that's how we deflect a lot of the harmful radiation coming from our star, coming from the sun. The next system that we're gonna talk about, and we'll talk about it actually on Thursday of this week, is the plate tectonic system here. The plate tectonic system is an interaction between the deeper part of the mantle, the fluid asthenosphere, the convecting liquid part of the mantle, and the cold, rigid, uppermost part of the mantle that we call the lithosphere. Without going into too much detail, the, um, the deep mantle is very hot, right? And that transfers its heat up into the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere starts to convect and rotate, and by doing that, will actually move around pieces of the cold, rigid lithosphere these are the things that we know as uh, tectonic plates, right? Tectonic plates are just pieces of cold, rigid lithosphere that are moving around on the convecting asthenosphere. So we'll talk a lot about the plate tectonic system and how it actually can interact with some of the other systems like the geodynamo system. And last but not least, we will spend a lot of time talking about the climate system. The climate system is going to be the interaction between things like the lithosphere, right, the actual hard surface of the Earth, the hydrosphere, that's all of the water in Earth systems, and the atmosphere, right, the gas envelope around our planet, and how all three of those interact then with up the planet's life systems, right, the biosphere. So we're going to be looking at the interaction between a whole bunch of different Earth systems, all these different things that we've named spheres here, right? And all these different systems that we see throughout the planet are going to be interacting with each other. And while they are all components that do lead to the Earth system as a whole, they do interact with each other so that they are not completely independent. For example, uh, in the plate tectonic system, if we have uplift of uh, a mountain belt, that will actually help to increase weathering on a global scale. Uh, weathering actually consumes and removes CO2 from the atmosphere, so that can affect the atmosphere. That brings global temperatures down and that can actually affect things like the amount of water in the system, right? Lots of water can actually now become frozen and go into what we call the cryosphere. And then of course, uh, humans and a lot of all the other animals and plants have to now deal with the decrease in temperature due to the decrease in CO2. So that affects the biosphere. So we'll be talking about this uh, throughout the um, the next couple of weeks, how each of these Earth systems interacts uh, to create the main Earth system. But remember that each of these components is just kind of one gear in the whole network of uh, systems that runs the planet as a whole. Okay, so don't forget, there's no lab today, right? This is Tuesday, so there's no lab today, but I will see you guys tomorrow. You'll do your lecture in the morning or whenever you decide, and then I will see you guys all tomorrow, which will be Wednesday, and we will have our first lab at 10 o'clock on topographic maps. So I'll see you guys all tomorrow at 10 o'clock Wednesday during Zoom for our lab.